Boy, it sure is a windy one out there. I wonder if the microphone's picking that up. It's amazing to hear the birds chirping through the wind. I wonder if... Do they have to chirp louder? <laughs> like, like yelling over the TV? Hmm. All right, enough stalling. Time to pick on Trump and Trump voters. Why are they so angry? What is it about white America where so many of us are, are angry? I mean, we're on top of the world, right? Uh, but then when we lose a bit financially, or more and more of us are born into poor families, it's harder and harder to see what our white privilege is exactly. Except that you can still get pulled over by the police and not be shot for taking out your wallet, or you can walk through a store and not have a security guard follow closely behind you. Uh, you can have certain types of conversations with other white people that non-whites can't have or have to sort of work their way into, have to prove themselves first to have these types of conversations. There's a whole host of things that we just continue to take for granted, even though we don't have a lot of money, because money is what we're told to care about the most. So all that other privilege is kind of out the door. And then poor white people, of course, don't care about statistics that say, statistically speaking, blacks are more likely to end up poor or in jail or incarcerated for, you know, uh, crimes that whites would not be incarcerated for. You know, statistically speaking, nobody cares about statistics. They care about what's in front of them and how they feel about that. And, of course, if you have a... Fox News conservative drum, a Breitbart News, an alt-right, a Russians <laughs> a propaganda machine, you know, beating the drum of you're, you're losing your power, you're poor, you need to uh, do something about this, take your country back. Well, brainwashing, here we come. Now we know all that, right? But let's get into, let's get into what's at the root of this. Uh, what is the root of white American anger? And although I don't know as much about what's going on in the UK with Brexit and all of that, it seems like it's not just here. Uh, the angry, disenfranchised uh, white person thing <laughs> seems to be happening in European democracies as well. Right? France, for instance. Swang to the conservative side. The pendulum swung, and now it's swinging back, and on and on we go. And for rich people, uh, they want this pendulum to swing toward what's going to make them more money. And they don't care about you, but they'll use you. They'll stoke your fears, and your fear will turn to anger. And, and then they'll use that to make themselves more money. So why are you okay with that if you're you know, a conservative, a Trump voter, a for many of these countries, uh, voting in the conservative promise maker when they never follow through on their promises because that's not what they do. I mean, at least in this country, in America, on the Democratic side, uh, typically the, the Democratic Party um, will at least give you some lifelines, right? They'll throw you a bone, <laughs> Less and less as the years went on, this was the problem. Really, the problem is that Bill Clinton stole the Republican platform and moved the Democratic Party more to the right so that Democrats started to look suspiciously like Republicans. And so for Republicans to be Republican, they had to move even further to the right. And so they looked suspiciously crazy. Uh, so for the longest time, this is what we had. Republicans... Um, moderately Republican into completely conservative crazy. And now finally the progressives uh, are waking up thanks to the Wall Street protests of a few years ago and now, of course, Trump. Um, 
something has woken up on the left to try to swing that pendulum back. And it's easy to see what the liberal upset is about, the liberal anger. I mean, Trump is clearly, um, I mean, one of two choices. He's either uh, in, super intelligent and devious, or he's a complete moron and either way insane. Right? Uh, and so this does not a good president make. We've, we've entered idiocracy. And at first, liberals uh, seem to fall into their own trap of, after the election, wondering why, you know, how, how did we go so astray? Why, why didn't we, if we could just teach these poor, ignorant Republicans, uh, show them the light, then this will never happen again. We must try to understand them. We must come out of our liberal bubble. They fell for the narrative, the Fox News narrative of the liberal elites living in a bubble. Now, in some sense, there is the bubble, but not in this ultimate sense where we need to like start understanding these people like they're uh, animals in the forest, you know? Um, no, it's pretty obvious. It's been obvious that there are people, and it's around 30 to 40% of the country, unfortunately, or, or at least the voting public, uh, who don't care to be educated who don't care about facts. In fact, a lot of them just vote on one issue, on abortion, right? So they don't even pay attention to politics, per se. Uh, and that's crazy. I mean, that is not even an issue in my book. I don't understand how this is a thing, except, oh, it's a religious thing. Um, so if these people aren't angry about the facts of their lives in a conscious way, if they were, they'd be liberal, then what are they so angry about? And why is it so easy to just take that anger and move it to topic to topic uh, to, to mobilize them to vote in a direction that is not in their best interest? Why is that? Why are they so easily manipulated by this this ethereal anger? Well, let's look. I mean, anger is repressed anxiety, right? Which often comes out as hostility. So I guess the question is, what are, what, what's white America so anxious about? And it is their loss of power. And they repress this anxiety about their loss of power uh, because the structures through which they held and still hold power include racism, sexism, and homophobia. So the very fact that it is socially unacceptable to be publicly racist, or at least was up until recently, uh, is the cause of anxiety. They have to repress that. And also, voting dumb, insane white people to power is done to instill fear in the opposition. This is the last stronghold of white privilege for a disappearing white middle class. This is why Trump voters stick with him. It's not because they care about the issues. It's because he speaks their language, the language of we're in power. So what I'm babbling about here is that while we tend to want to, in our starry-eyed way, look at these folks as though uh, they are incidentally, uh, on their best day, supporting racist, sexist, homophobic policies and rhetoric, um, really, that was always there. It's not incidental. They were always those things. It's just it was publicly, un publicly unacceptable, so they had to suppress it. Uh, because those things are the very things of holding power. Oppressing other people is how one holds power. You see what I'm saying? So if you are somebody who whose sense of self is predicated on the oppression of others, well, that necessarily means racism, sexism, homophobia. Otherwise, there's no oppression. <laughs> these, are, these are the tools. These are the tools of oppression and therefore the tools of power. So when they see that their white privilege is eroding, that their sense of power, as nebulous as that is, because you know you don't really have power unless you have money in this country, um, 
but you always, because of the color of your skin and because of your genitalia, uh, do have whatever slight more power, even in your poverty, than other people. That power is power. You'll take what you can get, right? And so, uh, again, when your self-identity is based on being above others, then your identity is based on racism, sexism, homophobia. And so, when someone comes along saying racist, sexist, homophobic things, you're not overlooking that because you like the guy's policies. Uh, those, those are going to be, hopefully for you, the very foundation of the policies that are going to allow you to feel as though you have some dignity in your life because... Hey, you're broke, but you're still not getting looked at funny. <laughs> when you go to the store, you're still not getting the sideways glance from cops when you're walking down the street. I know a lot of liberals are afraid that the next step for this president is dictatorship. But really, the Trump voter doesn't want dictatorship. They want what I've just outlined here. Now, some countries do live in, under brutal dictators, while others like ours merely toy with the idea. <laughs> uh, you know, it, which gets to the interesting question of why can't even free on paper societies like America get away from teetering on the brink now and then as the you know, political pendulum swings right and left? Why can't we get away from teetering on the brink of dictatorship? I mean... Essentially, what the Trump voter is, is a mini-dictator. It's a bunch of mini-dictators. It's, it's permission to run free with your oppression. It's not rallying behind an uber-oppressor like a dictator. It's that Trump has given people permission to be their own dictators, to be uh, the mob rule on the street. It's okay to go to Charlottesville and light your tiki torches and do your racist protests. A dictator rules over the country with an iron fist, with a military. Uh, you have to do what that dictator says. This is America. On our best day, we're free. And on our worst day, we're free to be our own dictators to other people. And you can only have that freedom if you have racism, sexism, and homophobia. I do think it would be easy uh, not right this moment, but in several years, if things kept going this way, I think it would be easy for a dictator to swoop in and take over. You know, if Trump had been the mastermind he thinks he is, uh, he would have been able to pull off a dictatorship, actually, I think. But thankfully, he's too stupid and narcissistic, and it's a bad combination. So he can't help but expose his plans every step along the way. And as a result, you know, he loses more and more followers uh, and more and more people plot to oust him uh, by really just charging him in a court of law uh, with the criminal plots that he's already admitted to hatching. Right? <laughs> like, he is the worst criminal. Uh, but if he had been smart, if he'd been able to hold on to uh, his base and grow it exponentially, then maybe, maybe this could have ended up where Trump, like some magician, is able to uh, get enough military leaders to lock down the country and start it over in his image, Trump America. But instead, he's uh, screwed it up in the pendulum swinging the other way. And um, again, the people in the streets who are his supporters don't really want that. I mean, I, I'm, what I'm saying is maybe they could be suckered into that somehow, some way, if he were more cunning. But as it stands now, they don't want a dictator. They want permission. And he gives them permission. Permission to feel powerful by putting down others, by repressing others, by bullying others, by murdering others. This is all fine to him. He doesn't care. 
It's not about any of that to him anyway. These are just tools for him of his own power. So what is this nebulous power we're talking about? What is this feeling that is so attractive that we born into a world that we barely understand with a finite amount of time on it, think we need to chase after and hurt other people to obtain? What is this? What does it mean to want to be a dictator? Well, it's to be God. It's, again, this fear of annihilation, which very easily is translated as the fear of death. How do we block that out? How do we block out our finiteness, the fear of ending? How do we block that out? The best way is to delude yourself into believing you're forever. And barring any evidence of that, <laughs> like, say, being super famous or having invented something that's going to be necessary in the future, uh, or doing great works of art, they're going to hang in museums long after you go, you know, all of these false sense of immortality that we've created. If you don't even have that, and YouTube just isn't enough, uh, there's always the good old-fashioned putting all of your time and energy into anger, into hatred of other people, creating a, a side, but not an equal side, creating a hierarchical upper echelon and putting yourself there. There are a number of ingredients that go into this, and we've talked about them on previous episodes of Our Undoing Radio, right? Talk about them all the time at OurUndoing.com. Uh, again, let's not underestimate the power of the collapse of prophecy in 2012, um, which sends an unconscious shudder through the minds of religious people with a savior mentality who are waiting for an event, uh, a, a moment where uh, their God comes back a cataclysm, a density change, a change in the vibrations, some, something that, that brings us into that higher realm, something that gives us power, <laughs> that gives us immortality, and something that recognizes us as we are right this moment, as the self, and says, hey, you're it. You're the pinnacle. You're the shining star. There ain't nothing you need to change, no, sir. Right this way, heaven awaits. Those days are finished. They're behind us. And when we don't deal with the reality that there's, there's no one coming to rescue us from ourselves, uh, we go crazy. We substitute the necessary step of the death of self. We substitute for that unconsciously a suicidal impulse. And that comes through as these mass shootings, that comes through, go down the list, that comes through as uh, electing a man with a scorched earth policy who gives you permission to let loose your anxiety and, and your crazy and your anger, um, but who also turns a blind eye to uh, what our pollution is doing to the earth because, hey, if God's not going to come back and transcend us off this rock, maybe we should kill it ourselves and go. We're crying for help to ourselves, but we're doing it by lashing out as psychotic bullies. I mean, this is mental illness. We are unwell, about 30 to 40 percent of the country. And so when you hear liberals talking about that, about there's a lot of people out there hurting. Um, no, that doesn't really get to it. Yeah, there's a lot of people hurting, but they're turning that hurt on their neighbor. They're hurting other people rather than feeling their own hurt. Because anger 
is a lot easier to to feel because you can act on it, right? It's something that you can lash out. It's not something where you need to sit down and look at yourself and say, oh, well, what's wrong? Like depression is something that you need to sit down and look at yourself because depression affects you. With anger, it feels as though you're angry at someone else. It feels like there's an external thing that you're angry at. And sometimes in life there is, right? Sometimes you stub your toe and it angers you <laughs> or whatever. But, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about this. And so as long as Trump speaks this way and treats people this way, and they don't catch on to the fact that he's actually promoting and enforcing the policies that are taking away their power or their sense of power, uh, while he's stoking the fires of their allowance of go, go ahead and bully people, uh, if they never catch on to this, then yeah, maybe he could stick around forever as a, a dictator, but it's not a dictator like Kim Jong-un is a dictator, right? It's not like uh, the people have to believe that he's a god. Uh, if they were to catch on, they could rise up. And granted, uh, we don't have the guns that the military has, but a lot of these folks have guns. And that's part of the deal, <laughs> right? Like, you can't be like, I give you permission to go overpower people and bully them, but also we're taking away your guns. Like, that would never happen. So those guns are sticking around, right? And so eventually, if people caught on, it would be like, you know, what I used to think was poorly written Stephen King dialogue of a mob rules scene, you know? Uh, it turns out, no, that actually just happens. He had it right. I just didn't believe that people could be that uh, stupid and monotone in their approach. Conformist, whatever word. But no, we see it. They would all turn on a dime and be like, wait a minute, he's trying to take away our freedoms. He's not who I thought he was. Let's get him. But, I mean, as long as he sings the song they want to hear and seems untouchable, sure, they'd stick with him. But it's not to the point where, like, uh, I think once all of his crimes come out and, you know, it turns out he committed treason or whatever has happened here, uh, even if they're not paying attention to it because they're watching the Fox Noise Network, they're not going to uprise when he is impeached. Or if he gets ousted, uh, and then he's allowed, you know, he can go directly to jail. Do not pass go. Finally, don't collect that $200. You know, there's not going to be riots in the streets, I don't think. I think there will be great sadness and then another repression of that mentality. It'll go back underground as the pendulum swings to the left. And it will be easy to do because as the pendulum swings to the left... And the leftists give the people what they actually need, such as health care, infrastructure, peace, <laughs> you know. Um, then life will be good, right? There's always that struggle. Whenever someone introduces something on the left that's like a really good policy that will benefit everyone, then the propaganda machine rolls out and the right wing rallies around not doing it for whatever unthinking reason that they do. Um, but if it becomes law, such as Obamacare becoming law, then people get acclimatized to it, they get accustomed, and um, then it becomes their entitlement, and you better not take that away from me. So that's how these things tend to stick around, is once they're put into practice, if they can get past the hurdle of the propaganda machine telling you why it's bad when it's not then once you see how great it is, you're not going to want different. You're going to want to improve it. You're maybe going to want to 2.0 it. I mean, in my opinion, I mean, Obamacare is a bad example because it should have been uh, single payer the whole time. It should not have been this deal with, uh, with insurance and all of that. But I, I get the argument that nobody would have passed that and blah, blah, blah. But okay, whatever the deal was with why we ended up with a, a half-baked health care, it was still way better than what we had before. And people do not want to give up on that. 
And we're at a point now where so many folks are willing to hear single-payer health care that will probably get something along those lines if the middle-of-the-road Republican Democrats, uh, the, the fake liberals in the party, if they don't get their greedy voices heard over the din of the progressives. I mean, this is the one point in our the, the arc of the swing <laughs> of the pendulum where liberal stuff could actually get done that then people would go, oh, God, you're not taking this away from me. And I think that fact would actually quell whatever uh, bad feelings are harbored on the right when their bully boy goes down. Um, it is a pendulum after all. And so here we are again on this show, confronted by the question, is this all good enough? I mean, if you accept my explanation of how this is working or any, you know, variation of it, maybe you think some things I've just said are a little exaggerated or some things are wrong, some things are right. But I mean, the basic gist of it, if you see that this is kind of how it works, is this the best that we are? I mean, it's certainly the best that we can do because of how we are. But is this what we are? Is this it? Is this the mind of man? I mean, we again switch over to heart cultures. We know that there is no such thing as the mind of man because our mind is so completely different from people living with nature. They're here. And uh, we look at what they do in longing. You know, you hear any of these folks talk, and uh, it's going to be a, crew, a room full of crying people who are like, I don't know why I'm crying. That was just so beautiful and spiritual and yada, yada. And it's like, well, yeah, because they're just saying what you already are and have forgotten. And that seems spiritual. Just health and balance seems spiritual because we're so completely off the rails. But what if there's a mind that is our mind that has nothing to do with any of this, that is untouched by the pendulum, unaffected, a mind that is completely outside of thought, but a mind that once is your mind engages with heart, engages logic through heart, but ultimately understands oneness. And doesn't just understand it, but sees through the eyes of all in one gulp. I mean, a revolutionary mind. A mind so powerful that the word power isn't even in its lexicon. Power isn't something it would strive for ever. Jealousy over anyone in a hierarchy wouldn't even be a thing. In this mind's very being, very existing is power. Is that us? Is that us when we're not running from ourselves into other identities higher and higher or as stagnation? Wishing things would go back to the way they were in a better day. When we're no longer these tropes running around as people, what is power? And who are we?